I want to pose a few questions that are things that we've dealt with, but we haven't really, uh, and I don't expect we'll reach a conclusion, but I'd like a little discussion. What, what's the collective thought about high school and college together in one bill, separate? Um, you know, I, I'm curious, for, for those who have an opinion on this, what, what, what's the thought? Jim? That question was posed last week, and I've thought about it since. Um, and at first I was a little reluctant, and my answer was dependent on the dynamic of the state. I think it's a great idea to do it, and for a couple of reasons. To do both together? To do both together. Yeah. As long as you maintain separate code sections for each of the respective um, rights. I, th I think it's it's a good thing. One of the things I think, one of the advantages I think that does is we're talking about continuity involving the students from the high school level to the college level. You've got an eight-year period now um, where if somebody is going to be involved potentially at the high school level and they want to study journalism, they're going to carry that through. And so you're going to get more Brian's and more Josh's um, that way. Uh, and so I think that's a good thing, and it, especially as they're learning, if the learning curve becomes a little bit less steep um, for them within their respective states, um, I, I think it's a, just a tremendous advantage. Mm -hmm. The other advantage, I think, is the arguments are the same for both. Um, while there may be a greater comfort level for administrators to have a little bit um, better ability to um, influence the content uh, at that level, uh, the argument for protection remains the same at both levels. And um, if you divide them out or if you do one over the other, I think you're just playing into administrators' arguments that there's a need for greater protection at the high school level. So I take it you agree, some Frank. Thoughts. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the other thing I was going to say, as a practical matter, I couldn't agree more. As a practical matter, curious what is going to happen. If you pass the college law and you say, well, let's wait five years and have five years of experience, one of two things is going to happen. Either nothing is going to happen, um, 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 there'll, be, there'll be no experience, or there'll be a negative experience. Some college kid in Schenectady will put a picture of his ass in the newspaper, and that will become the poster child for why we should not have college as student press freedom. And so the, the, the fact is, if the bill works as we want it to work, nothing will happen. But nothing is not a demonstrably good result to take, uh, to take the legislature. That's a good point. Any, yeah, I mean, Mike. I'll just say, you know, my only concern here is I think the window of opportunity to get both of these things passed uh, maybe somewhat limited because I mean just in Washington State alone I've talked to others uh, there I've talked with three colleges there uh, where administrators have raised the hosty uh, you know uh, case is, is a reason for censorship and, and I'm just afraid this could be used to prevent censorship that may happen before a joint bill could be passed well I'm just I don't know how long you're going to be able to hold off the college side um, if they're Getting more yeah. and more serious threats like this for, for an extended that, that period. That's sort of my point. Uh, if you're if you're really wanting, if you're, I, I think it'd be a lot easier to get a sole college bill passed than to get a combined bill. Mm -hmm. all, all the arguments, let's face it, are there are different arguments, and there's a much well, and tradition at the college level. So if you if it's, you think it's really important to get a college bill passed, mm -hmm. then I think keep it separate because you probably would have much more difficult of getting the two together. And obviously in Illinois, the home of Hostie, it was very important. Yeah, and and you know I don't intend to suggest that this is a decision that can be made universally because it does depend on the circumstances in your own state. Two concerns. Number one, if 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 you split them up and you go after one, there may not be any energy left to go after the second one when you bring it back up. So that's my first my first point that I would make on that in in keeping them together but the second one one of the I had a great relationship with my last principal and any time I would come to her to talk to her about a story we were getting ready to do and I would always simply ask the question how's that gonna affect your day one of the points she brought up is that your publication meaning my pub, my kids publication writes their articles to an 18 year old audience when I do the math meaning her when she does the math we actually have more kids closer to 14 than to 18 in our school, meaning we have more kids closer to middle school than to college. Now, the only thing, I would, what I would say to that now in tying the two together is that more and more every day, college, or high school students are taking college level courses. They're starting AP courses as young as freshman year in my high school now. So it's this, if, if we're talking about a ped, pedagogical reasoning and whether or not they're ready for the material and whether or not they can handle the responsibility of making these decisions on their own, yes, 
because we're already asking them to do it every day in their other um, academic activities. So I, I think that they very much should stay linked together. That's a really good argument. Uh, you should write that down so we Yay have me. it somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. I'm um, out. <laughs> you know, our <laughs> related question write that in down? terms of about inclusion in a bill. <laughs> What's our sense of the advisor protection provision? You know, it's interesting because I know there was a discussion among the Washington folks. Somebody said, let's start with an advisor protection. Um, and my experience has been that's typically the most controversial provision in any of these bills. That's what the schools will fight against the most because it does limit their hiring and firing ability in their minds at least. Um, I, w anybody have a sense on whether that is something to definitely include or as in California, add later. Isn't that what Oregon had to give up yes. in order to get their bill passed? Yes. No, yeah, go ahead. Morgan, along with that, though, has there ever been, and, and I apologize, I probably should know this, is there a correlation between, uh, or, and you and Frank might know this, between complaints in those states where certification is not required to be the advisor? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, we're right back to Hazelwood. Mm -hmm. How often is there a link between the issue and the fact that the person who's leading the effort has no background or training in what well, I mean, you'd get pushback if you didn't know anything about football and you were the coach. I mean, I mean, if we're talking about sports analogies, so I, have we ever done anything to search to see if that's the case? We haven't done research, and I, I think any research is going to be to, to my way of thinking, is, is going to be suspect in that our experience is that contrary to what you would think, it is not sort of the quote unquote bad programs that generate the most censorship complaints. Sometimes it's the best educated programs because the students actually have to be sufficiently knowledgeable and motivated and educated to know that something wrong is going on and, 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 and also sometimes sufficiently aggressive to try to push the envelope on publishing something that, you know, that they're told not to. And, and so a lot of times it's actually the good programs that, that generate um, censorship mm -hmm. complaints to us. So, so I think that, that statistic is just going to be inherently flawed. As Frank said early, today that you know there we're we've really dealing with a lack of research that could help us and that's something i think we should all think about cuz anybody at least at an institution of higher education can have an influence on what kind of research is being done in your own jurisdiction yeah uh, to respond to your first question last question and then your first question is uh, i think that and, and this is going to sound very republican and i'm never <laughs> accused of that is that i think a lot of this really has to be decided state by state yeah. Uh, the state of Massachusetts, for example, they're going to pass anything that sounds like free speech, right? I mean, uh, it's it's not coincidence that they were the first state to join in, but um, uh, but but seriously, I think that that the question about uh, an advisor protection act has to be viewed that way. That might be a little harsh for a state that is a little more red right. or ruby red these days, uh, but. Uh, the same thing with, uh, with whether or not uh, uh, you ought to link college and high school together. My instinct tells me that, you, that there's more need for it, particularly if you buy into the, the civics argument. There's a greater need for high schools now than there is college. And I'm always struck uh, at Ball State by how much First Amendment religion college students get, and they get it in the first month of their journalism program. And the need really is down at the level... Uh, and at the high school level, particularly among kids who aren't going to go on to college, mm -hmm. that aren't going to get the same kind of indoctrination right. that they might get in a journalism program. Right. So I would say high school first in many instances. James. Uh, going back to the advisor protection, we had a very strong advisor protection in our 97 legislation. That was never an issue. That never never mm -hmm. came up. And of course, there's, 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 in the college law, there's advisor protection also. Anyway, I did, I was involved in a, a study, God, it's been, it was published in Journalism Educator years ago, that uh, the, uh, we, we did a study of, uh, of uh, uh, censorship issues that were published in the SPLC report, and to see why, and then, uh, this was obviously at the college level, it was at the college level there, and, uh, to, to see then uh, what kind of journalism program were at those universities when this happened. And we found that almost all of the problems came at schools that did not have strong programs. And our, we, we had no, we, our, our, our sense was that uh, the reason was that at, at colleges that have strong journalism programs, they had advocates there that would squelch those sorts of issues before they ever got to that 
it, but it was pretty consistent that they, they were all at, at schools that didn't only had a minor and didn't really have a program and and so I mean from that standpoint that's sort of opposite of what mm -hmm. what uh, what uh, Frank was saying mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at the high school level but that that's been 15 years ago right. when we did that but Tori I just um, was wondering you raised it before Mark about the off-campus issue and what impact that has on this debate and whether there's even been any argument or research probably not done on this obviously the technology is driving this off-campus issue about speech um, but it, is there any way for us to say link argue that the fact that we are shutting down expression on property is pushing that expression off property and yeah. potentially making it worse well, that's, that's, yeah that's, that's a good argument it argument. also does though raise the question of should we be drafting bills differently today to respond to the growing effort to silence the off-campus speech I mean you know the sad fact is, is especially you know in light of the bong hits for Jesus you know Supreme Court decision there's now I think sort of a, a growing belief uh, and I'll tell you, I talked to a bunch of school lawyers who believe this. They think they can punish students for anything they say just about anywhere. Um, that perception is growing, and, and you know, um, there are some courts that are agreeing with them. Um, it, it does raise the question of should we expand this beyond the traditional media to apply to all student expression, um, which is, you know, California and, and um, um, Massachusetts laws are more generic than, than some of the others. So. Well, clearly, I think you have to do that in some way. Um, uh, more and more advisors I talk to uh, see their administration differentiating between a student newspaper and print and a website. Right, right. And if we don't stay out ahead of that, um, yeah. uh, that's going to sneak up behind us right. in some manner. Maybe, maybe new laws or maybe other laws need to be modified. Yeah. Uh, to specifically state that a website is p part of student media. Please don't make us go back to all the laws that already exist <laughs> and do with them. Frank and then Carol, I think you had a comment. Yeah. I mean, Warren brought up the concept of civics, and I do think that, well, we're going to have to grapple with this because it's coming whether we initiate it or not, and that <coughs> is this whole push about cyberbullying regulation, right? Yeah. And I just wonder, I don't know what, what this would look like, but I wonder whether cyberbullying provides a window of opportunity for people in the free speech community to get together with people who are concerned about cyberbullying and to, in effect, have a package of legislation which says, okay, here's what you can't say and here's what you can. And, and, and we provide the here's what you can, you know? And is cyberbullying legislation and cyberbullying and sort of media responsibility education a Trojan horse by which to get the First Amendment into the classroom. Th th yeah, that, that's such a brilliant idea, I think, Frank. <laughs> the trick is, are they going to be willing to narrow those cyberbullying limitations to the speech that we actually find justifiable of punishment and not something that someone says that hurts somebody's feelings? Right, you know? and that's so, why I say I think we're, we're going to be in that yeah. fight anyway, so why not be in it? Why not be in it offensively? Well, you're right, and, and yeah. we haven't talked about that, but, you know, Tori was at a conference where we discussed this, that I believe cyberbullying is what is going to pose the greatest threat to this effort moving forward. Is about, about the online presence for a high school publication, for instance, is that everybody's worried about all the scary people online mm -hmm. and yada, yada, yada. Whenever I have these conversations, I say that's what MySpace and Facebook are for. Mm -hmm. But... As far as like mean speech and all of that stuff that everyone's worried about, my kids will not waste print paper on the shiny happy stories of our school. All of my breaking news, which is a daily 24 hour news cycle thing that each kid is assigned to do a breaking news story a certain day of the month or whatever, every single piece of news on our ASNE site that's a breaking news story is all about the awesome time they had in Mr. Smith's class or the cool experiment they did in chemistry today. So the good PR stories about schools are showing up online because we won't waste paper on them <laughs> and our schools are terrified of an online presence. It's hilarious to me. Yeah. You know, one, one last issue that I want to focus on because this is something I know has come up and I think we need to sort of talk about how we deal with it. You know, there are 
organizations, because of their tax exempt status, that are very clearly, well, I shouldn't say clearly, because nothing about this is clear, mm -hmm. have some limitation on their ability to engage in lobbying. And, you know, Logan and I have had this conversation, and certainly at the SPLC, you know, there were policy decisions made based on the law and, and you know, just what our we thought our role was that we weren't going to engage in lobbying. What I would like us to discuss a little bit is for those who are limited in their ability to actively lobby, what do we think we can do as organizations to help support the effort to defend student press freedom that won't be explicitly tied to actively lobbying for legislation, Sandy? Uh, from my standpoint, I am. Uh, I've been several times even with working with JA, I've been limited in what I, as an organization, I could endorse. but. Um, because we're that educational. Uh, and I think what we can do is help to either collect, publish, fine tune information to disseminate. Like when I talked, when I asked earlier the question to Jim about talking points, you know, that we facilitate the creation of those kind of things that take what you all have already created in here with that legislative agenda plan, you know, and, 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 and expand it. You know, um, in in ways that I think the insight that you provided today that would I think be really beneficial to those people on the ground who could then take it. How, how to find the gyms? Mm -hmm. Education and information, absolutely, and demystifying the process that everybody has to go through state by state. Uh, we found that I think that we tried to do that in Washington State was to explain how the committee structure worked. So when people went to our website, they could say, "Oh yeah, okay, this is what they got to do now." Complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Can you summarize what the law is in 25 words or less? Well, you know, my <laughs> sense is this is, uh, you know, if you are independently, well, an independent not for profit corporation, you know, unless you become an electing organization which allows you to spend X percent of your, you know, um, you know, um, um, expenses each year on lobbying, which is an amount that probably would be way more than you ever would spend, that, y you know, it is somewhat vague, and basically you can only spend a minimal amount, and if you go over it, you run the risk of losing your taxes and status. My personal opinion is the amount that any one of our organizations would spend would be so small that this is not an issue. But I appreciate their boards and others who feel concerned about that and also who just don't want the organization to be in the role of lobbying. But, you know, let me suggest this. One thing that I believe is that I, again, the reason you're all here is because I operate under the presumption that we all agree that a free student press is vitally important for different reasons, for multiple reasons, but it's vitally important. One thing that I think we can do without adding on, and thus we support student free expression legislation, we can all sign off on a statement of support of our belief in the role of a free student press. Um, and that's maybe, I think, a first step for us to take collectively, Logan, yeah. Well, I just want to emphasize, too, that, you know, NSPA's logo is conspicuously absent from the, <laughs> the, the coalition in Washington. And part of that is a philosophy from the NSP board, at least in the last year, um, that it's not consistent with the mission of our organization to go out and support legislation uh, actively. Not that we're against it, because certainly we're for free expression for students, but also, the decision-making timeline, frankly, just needs to be longer. I mean, we're just not going to do business on a, let's get everybody together by email and quick look at this and put your logo on it. That's just not how it's going to work for us. So I will say, you know, maybe speaking on behalf of our board member who's in the room, um, that organizations like ours are open to hearing more ideas and signing on to statements. And I would, I would love to have something to be able to put on our website as, Here's our position on this kind of issue, because I do get a lot of I get a lot of press calls, as I'm sure you and Frank and others get, because you have the executive director kind of role after your name, that people want you to comment on certain things, and I'd like to be able to point to something and say, and I think that would help. And I also think there's a role for the Center for Scholastic Journalism, for state press associations, who are. 501c3s maybe, but they don't have the advantage of a really good attorney like we have to advise us, to let us know about the law and what you can and can't do. There, there could be a, a fact sheet for state associations like WJEA or, or other groups. Yeah, I'm a little bit of the view 
we we don't need to worry about this as much as others do, but I'm definitely in the minority viewpoint of people who've offered an official opinion on that. So I'm probably not the best person to offer a viewpoint because I like do whatever the heck you want. You're not going to have a problem. That said, though, let me let me say this. One of the first things that I'm going to do as a result of this is work on putting together a statement of principle about our support for college press freedom, or excuse me, high school press freedom, scholastic press freedom. And um, I, I, what I'm going to do is circulate that to this group as a starting point. And I think one of the efforts that I would like to see the Center for Scholastic Journalism engage in, and uh, assuming Candace and, and John sign off on this, um, I think I can twist their arms, is to start going to other organizations, professional press groups, library groups, whoever, and ask them to endorse. Because I think the more we can get to sign on to a statement similar to what they have in Washington, the, the easier it is to present an argument that this is not just a lonely group in, you know, Utah or, you know, wherever, um, trying to support this legislation. Not that there's anything happening in Utah, but um, that um, w w unified we have power that we may not have taken full advantage of yet. So. Yeah, Jim. Just to maybe follow it up with something, too. One of the things that we've had some success with in California um, is we've also established mentorship programs between professional <coughs> newspapers and high schools and colleges in particular areas. And it's been more from a resource standpoint, providing money and expertise um, to those schools that may be underfunded, their programs may be underfunded, or the journalism advisor may not have the same network that all of you folks have. but. Um, the effect that that's had has been rather interesting because if the local newspaper is mentoring the local um, uh, journalism program, then they're tied to that program. They have an interest in that program. And I think the more that that can be created, you were talking about reaching out to the professional press. Mm -hmm. I think that's one practical way of right. doing that. And then when they get the statement that the group uh, is going to send out, there's buy-in on two different levels. Mm. Right. That's that's a great point. You know, someone we haven't heard much from is Josh, who's really <laughs> probably in, in more of the hot suite than anybody else, because he's got a bill that's actually, you know, on its way here. Josh, I'm curious as to what your feeling is about, you know, how your process is going to go and next steps and what you think your likelihood of success is. Honestly, I feel like I'm just getting started, so I feel like this has been a really good day for me to understand what, you know, Washington and what other states have been through. So, I don't know, I guess my next step is, first of all, to meet with my state representative next week, actually, um, to discuss his thoughts on, like, the, I guess the political process of how it needs to go. And um, I have a meeting two weeks from now with um, society professional journalists, um, so I've I don't know, I guess... To yeah. ask for their support for right. the bill, yes. Right, Do you have a sense of where they stand on this? Um, I know the national or organization has, like, their, like two or three of the faculty teach at my school, so mm -hmm. they've already said that they plan on supporting it. But right. um, I don't know, I guess getting from you all, I, I need to involve more of the, these organizations and the, uh, the political aspect is kind of what I'm getting from today. What, that's a great question. What can we do to help you? Uh, you know, you're our only hope, Obi-Wan, so <laughs> tell us. Um, what, what, what can the members of these organizations, the, the leaders of these groups, the folks who are in this room do to help your job? Is there anything that you can think of that would be beneficial to you? Uh, I mean, not right this moment, okay. but I mean... Well, one of the reasons, yeah, <laughs> one of the reasons that we made the contact list, obviously, even though many people in this room know each other um, well, too well, um, that, you know, I think everybody has their expertise and, and their um, support. And, you know, I, I say that, you know, somewhat um, in jest, but I mean it very sincerely. He is the person who's now in the position that has the strongest likelihood of something happening next. Now, Washington could be not far behind, and, and you know, maybe Cheryl, something will happen with the Michigan bills. Um, but, um, which by the way, I, I realized at lunchtime, I guess their bills still are there, um, although not officially dead. Mm. Um, chilly, but not dead. Um, but um, Josh and Kentucky, 
would be a great victory, you know, to have a, a, a state like Kentucky to actually move forward with this. And I think it's worth all of us, and those of us especially who have contacts in Kentucky, mm -hmm. to talk to them and see what we can do to help them support the effort that he and his um, colleagues are going to be engaging. Yeah, I appreciate you take that stuff we talked about earlier, where you know the number of lawsuits that have come out of these states that actually have legislation is so minimal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Because I think that that's one of the biggest arguments they have against a bill like this is that that it'll open them up because of the lack of control. When in fact, you know, one of the things people always I don't know if anyone out else who was a high school educator ever got this, but whenever I say I'm a high school teacher, people go, oh, <laughs> and I go, what? And, 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 they, and they don't get that high school kids are just like any other person. The more responsibility you give someone, the more responsibility they'll take, and they'll rise to the occasion. And that's kind of the basis of these bills. The more responsibility we give them, the less likely they are to run amok with, with, with the rights they have because they realize that they shoulder all this responsibility. So make sure you take that information about the lack of lawsuits in, in the free expression states.